In the beginning, one man and one woman made one choice. They traded friendship with God for knowledge. They caused a fracturing that could never be repaired. The darkness spread until Abraham was beckoned by God toward promises he could not imagine. God told Abraham that everyone would be blessed through his family. A son was born. But the darkness remained. Abraham's grandson wrestled with God. Jacob's sons were hardly saints, but the family grew and waited for redemption. A family became a nation, but they only knew whips and fear. A wavering voice rang out for freedom and righteousness. Moses led them to the land of their fathers. The people built lives in the land and looked for a leader. A boy named David was anointed by the Lord. The people were blessed and prospered like never before. But David's descendants ushered a depravity. The kingdom fell again into darkness. Elijah called the people to repentance. When he was gone, others took up his cry. When the people loved the darkness more than the light, they lost the land. The prophets wept, faced beasts, and endured flames, all while longing for justice and restoration. Nehemiah returned and rebuilt, but it did not stop the shadows. The people fell under other tyrants, and freedom and blessings were strangers once more. They could only wait for salvation. But in the midst of the chaos, a son was born from the line of David. All of the waiting collided with the goodness of God in a Savior, Jesus. He came with the blessings of Abraham, the justice of Moses, the lordship of David, and the voice of the prophets. His life, death, and resurrection shook the darkness with more light than it could bear. Many heard his message and bore it far away. The suffering, the lowly, heard the promise of hope. The earth was forever changed. Boom. There we go. <laughs> Honestly, I, can, I have no idea how this is going to go. <laughs> um, feel free to laugh. Feel free to participate with me. Um, I am here because I believe God can do great things. I, I stand right here because I know he will change my life as well. And he is working in my life continuously till I die. And then there's going to be this gloriousness in heaven. There's a, there's a beauty about mistakes as well. I actually, this is, before we get into this, <laughs> um, I love making mistakes. It's this weird thing I feel. Um, I, it, it's hard, it's difficult. You guys probably have times where you feel overwhelmed. There's a lot of things going on, worry, concerns, just things piling up at work, with family, even death. But those mistakes remind us of something, that we can't do this alone. And if I was to be able to do this alone, then I wouldn't need Jesus. But I need Jesus. We need Jesus. Every time I make a mistake, I'm reminded of that. Because I know if I was perfect, if I was able to do this all, all alone, I wouldn't even think about Jesus. I make so many mistakes when I'm not thinking about Jesus. So I'm thankful for those mistakes until I get together, until I can just radiate Jesus and be, reflect him perfectly. So today we're talking about Christ. We, uh, we went from creation to corruption, and now we're in redemption. We're continuing the story of Jesus the reason why we call ourselves Christians, or why you might understand what, or what is Christianity. Well, Christianity is being a Christ follower. It's about a man, a man who is fully human and fully divine. N.T. Wright once said, Christianity is all about the belief that the living God has accomplished all of this, the finding, the saving, and the giving of new life. Jesus. So, I have the pleasure to continue in the climax of our epic story about Jesus. This is the pinnacle right here, guys. 
We have so much information throughout the whole Word of God. This Bible, the Word of God, has so many things inside of it, from history to wonders to poems to prayers. We see life, we see death, we find many answers, and we have many questions while we read it. It is filled, as you see, saw in the video, there's, it's filled with so many things. It can be overwhelming. It can be frightening. It can be uncomfortable. And that's a good thing. There's a lot to live off of. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of people that we can learn from in this book. And you will see in, the, uh, in this New Testament, the New Testament about Jesus, the Gospels. You'll read about Jesus. But I believe also, and this is what it means to be a Christian, is that the Old Testament also reflects Jesus. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into what it means to be a Christian, what, how Jesus reflects the Old Testament as well, how he sheds light upon it, and how we believe the Old Testament sh shines light upon him as well. So we're going to do this in four main points. You know, that's the typical sermon right there. <laughs> we, uh, the first one is called, uh, Jesus is the new Adam. Jesus is the new Adam. What do I mean by that? Well, in Romans 5, you guys will see that Paul says, just as one man brought sin into the world, and thus producing death, then one man, God brought grace upon us and gave us one man who brings us life, a justification, a balancing point. So, many of you know the story of Adam, okay? Adam and Eve were in the garden, okay? And a serpent comes. The serpent comes, and God gave them one rule, not to, to eat from any of these trees in the garden. You have this whole garden to yourselves. This is, this is yours, but you can't eat from this one tree, this one tree, the knowledge of good and evil. The serpent comes along, tempts Eve. God would want you to have this, this knowledge. And he said you would surely die, but you won't. Don't worry. He loves you. It's all about, you, about love, right? Well, Eve decided to give in to that temptation. While, don't forget, Adam was standing right there. And then he partook as well. Sin entered the world. God came down, walking in the garden, trying to find these two. And he saw the cookie crumbs from the cookie jar. He found out, he knew they were caught red-handed. They knew that they were naked. They knew that they sinned. They made a large mistake, a mistake that radiates even today. Death. Death. This is what he, uh, Hebrew says. 4.15 states, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And I can tell you from personal experience I don't think I could follow somebody who didn't live the life that I lived, who didn't understand my difficulties, who didn't understand where I came from. Jesus does. He was tempted in every way, tempted in every way, yet did not sin. Some greater theologists than I state that there is a unity between Adam and the human race in our sin and the consequent death. And then a unity between Christ and believers and the justification and eternal life. So let's simplify this. Adam brought death. Jesus brought life. Adam brought death. Jesus brings life. So unlike Adam, Jesus resisted the temptation. He was content in obeying the Lord, in obeying God. He was okay with that. He wanted that to the point of death on the cross, to obeying that. Was it difficult? Yes. He asked for it to be taken from it if it was his will. But he went and died on the cross for us. So Jesus lived out the law of love, out the law of love. 
It's amazing. He also simplified the law into two commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And he said this, this is the first and most important commandment, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. He lived this out and taught others to live this out as well and did so perfectly, did so with temptation. And if you uh, read the Gospels, you'll find that even after God came, uh, he was bat- Jesus was baptized, God said that this is my son who I my love. With him I am well pleased. And in an ironic way or purposefully, Jesus went to the wilderness to be tempted as well and overcame that temptation. Jesus is the new Adam. Point two, Jesus is the new Moses. He's not just a replacement to Moses, though. He is superior in every way and superior to every, uh, every mediator before and after Moses as well. Everyone. So just as Moses delivered the Hebrews out of Egypt, Jesus delivered us from our bondage of sin. How did he do that? Well, not just he led us to eternal life through the cross. If we only had that, if Jesus only did that, saved us from our bondage to sin, we should be in awe of him. That is amazing. There's not one man that has done that. Not one man. And we should be in awe of just that. That's why we sing here today. That's why we worship. That's why we come together. That's why I want to be like this man. That's why I follow Jesus Christ. He is so much more. Moses led God's people and built the tabernacle. Jesus was also a leader of God's people and built all creation. Moses displayed God's glory through turning a staff into a snake. Pretty cool to the 10 plagues, to splitting the Red Sea. Jesus also displayed the Father's glory by healing, healing the sick and the lame. He also multiplied food. He brought the dead back to life. He also displayed power, uh, power over all dark authorities and even cast them out. Jesus did a lot. He did so much, and it it seems like such a short amount of time. And it's incredible. I'm 26 right now, and I don't feel like I've accomplished a whole lot in my life. And somehow Jesus, he transformed the world, the past, and the future. Transformed the past and the future. We, We serve an amazing God. We serve an amazing God. What seemed logical, though, was his death. Death would stop this man. Death would stop this Jesus in his ministry. But what death did only was to actually expose the darkness. That what opposed him is now, it made a mockery of it. Jesus' death on the cross made a mockery of all these dark forces that opposed him. He was the new lawgiver. He is the new Moses, fulfilling the Mosaic law by living out the law of love. So the author of Hebrews states in his opening paragraph that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory in the exact representation of his being. He's a perfect reflection of our God Almighty. A perfect reflection. Furthermore, he says that Jesus is superior to the angels. Now, if we go back to Deuteronomy, okay, Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, uh, we will see that the, uh, the Torah and uh, God's word were given to Moses at Mount Sinai by angels, okay? And then all, uh, they were, uh, Israel was then called to pay close attention to the Torah, okay, the first five books of the Bible, the law. They were supposed to pay close attention. Now, if Jesus is superior to angels, and angels were the ones that gave uh, Moses the law and God's word, then how much more are we supposed to pay close attention to Jesus Christ? 
there's really an excitement about that. There's a deeper meaning to this. He's not just a man. That I, I might have to pay close attention to this man. But in the book of Hebrews, we also find a stern warning. You'll see that uh, the Israel, they disobeyed uh, Moses. Moses brought them out of Egypt. They were enslaved by Egypt. Ten plagues came from God to Egypt to set them free. They finally got out of that place. They crossed the Red Sea, and still they were going to go to the promised land, and they were scared. They didn't trust in God. They didn't trust him. So guess what they did? They spent 40 years wandering in the desert. If you're 40 or older, or you, if you're younger, just think of your whole life. <laughs> It means nothing at all. I'm going to just spend 40 years wandering in a desert. It's really hard to imagine that. Just walking around, missing out on a glorious gift. Missing out on a glorious gift. So, so if we are saying that scriptures state that Jesus is superior to Moses, how much higher are the stakes if we rebel against Jesus, if we reject Jesus? Moses, by rejecting Moses, they spent 40 years in the desert. By rejecting Jesus, how much higher are the stakes if he is superior to the angels that gave Moses that law? So in Deuteronomy 18, God promises through Moses that he will raise up a future prophet and who will lead after Moses is no longer with them. And second, an elaborate system was in place for worship, priesthood, and the offering of sacrifices for various purposes, including the atonement for sins. Which leads us to point number three. Jesus is our new high priest. Jesus is our new high priest. Israel's priests came from the line of Aaron, okay? So they were to go before God and offer sacrifices to atone for the sins of the people. Now, the priests were flawed and had to offer sacrifices for themselves too and everyone else. They did this on a daily basis and yearly on the Day of Atonement. But we sin daily. We sin daily. So this was never enough. It was never enough. They needed something more. Jesus was that something. Jesus was that something. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. He gave his life on the cross so that we might live forever, that we might be forgiven, that the slate is now wiped clean. It's not just a one-day thing and then we're going to do it again. This covers life. This covers the world. This covers all of us. This covers the past and the future if we accept it if we accept it. A high priest would sacrifice his animals daily. That was just their job. But the sacrifices were never enough. But by believing in Jesus, we are forgiven. We are forgiven. That sin that we sin daily, the mistakes that we make on a regular basis, the people that we don't want to be, the person that I would be without him, I am forgiven. I'm given a chance to live, to live right. And when I make that mistake, when I fail time and time again, I can come to him and he can teach me. I can learn. The beauty of Jesus is that he was morally flawless. Morally flawless did nothing wrong, and is eternally available. That's the beauty of him being our mediator between us and God, God the Father. He will always be there. We'll never need a new high priest. We will never need one because he is always there for us. There, there's a beauty in that. Jesus is greater than all the mediators, and to reject him is really to reject the actual forgiveness of sins, that gracious gift that is given to us, that we can open as we want. If we want to want it, we can open it. It is right there for us to take. 
All we have to do is believe in him. So we're turning our backs if we do rebel. Now, alongside the prophets and priests, a third type of leader emerges. Now, Israel is given a king to rule over them, a king. Now, after Saul, which wasn't that great, <laughs> David rules firmly. King David rules firmly. Now, this was the boy that slayed Goliath. This was the boy who was the youngest, the youngest that was greater than all his brothers. People were afraid of Goliath, but he took him down. He took him down because he believed in that God, the God that we are here today to, to worship, the God that we live for, the God that we live for. God promised him that he will be followed by a son whose house and kingdom will be established, established forever. Jesus. This brings us to our last point, the new king. Jesus is the new king. He is who we worship. Jesus, uh, Jesus is the new king. We find in Matthew 1 that the Messiah was expected to come from the line of David. But Micah 5.2 uh, 2 prophesies uh, that he will come out of Bethlehem. He will come out of Bethlehem, and he did. John, it will read this throughout the Gospels, uh, a large crowd gathered to worship him. They grabbed palm branches and shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna to the, uh, to the king of Israel. How awesome is that? He felt, I can't imagine how he felt, but the people felt like they had a king that will rule forever. And shortly after, he was betrayed by one of his own. Betrayed by one of his own. He was taken before Pilate then. And Pilate asked, are you the king of the Jews? To which Jesus replied, my kingdom is not from this world. And shortly after, the people, the same people that were saying that he is our king, now shouted, crucify him. Crucify him. How easy our minds can change. How easy is it? And then something beautiful happens. Something tragic, but something beautiful. Jesus gave his life, died on a cross for us, for everyone here, for everyone in this community. <laughs> Not just for the people like Mother Teresa. He died for our enemies. He died for the world. That we might know him. And that we can be changed and transformed by his, by his story. So, after being crucified, he was put in a tomb that was guarded. And three days later, he was resurrected. He spent 40 days here on earth before he went and ascended into heaven, where he sits down at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty. He is the new king. He is the new king. And we find in Revelation 1 that Jesus rules over the kings of the earth, and John prophesied later that his kingdom will live, rule forever and ever. He will be ruler forever. He is the new king and the last king. He is the king over all kings. The king of kings. There's a lot of power in Jesus Christ. I can tell you, life can feel overwhelming. We sung today about fear, and it can, it can grab hold of you. Work can be a distraction. We want to find pleasure in many things because we always want the next thing, a new form of entertainment. 
But Jesus provides us with an answer, a life. How to find a joy in him forever, a relationship that will never end, a relationship that can be started today, a relationship that can be renewed today. We have this Jesus, the answer to creation, the answer to corruption and deliverance, the answer to our mediator with God, the Father, and a a powerful king whose kingdom will never fail, whose kingdom will never end. I want to have such an intimate relationship with this Jesus. I desire that, yet I am blinded almost on a daily basis to him. I I reject his call often. (laughs) We can know this Jesus. We can pick up where we left off. That forgiveness is now. His power has not dwindled. He is here with us now and can lead our lives, do miraculous things. Where we thought we had weak, where we were weak, he's now showing it's in our weakness, he can be glorified. How amazing is that? Through weakness, he can be powerful. That's where his light is shown. Christianity is questioned often. Some people fear it. Some people just don't understand it. And then there's others that they want nothing to do with it. There's a a question that you might want to ask or have thought about. Does being a Christian mean I have to be perfect or always have the right answer? This this is one that I believe is, is thrown around all the time. And I think it's a tricky one. Short answer, yes. Long answer, no. (laughs) I believe Jesus wants us to be perfect. I believe God wants us to be perfect. But we need him. We can't do this alone. And we can have that now. We can work towards that. Jesus came to show us how to live. He came to show us how to die to ourselves. How to put others first before us. That's a hard one for me. It's difficult, but he came to show us. So, what you and I need to do, though, is this, to give it a shot. Try. Give it all you got to live out love, to try it out. Jesus invited others to follow to teach them how to live God. What you and I need to do is try. When Jesus ascended into heaven, God sent the Holy Spirit. God sent the Holy Spirit. We have that Holy Spirit that was back then in this epic story still here today. We we worshiped about that Holy Spirit this morning that is present here, that we welcomed here, that is not just here. When you leave this building, he is with you. When you are concerned, when you are overwhelmed, he is there to guide you. When you are weak, he can flourish through you if you allow. Does that mean it's going to be easy? No. No. I can tell you that from right now. (laughs) Sometimes it's easy to live in fear, but we also worship about that. We're not a slave to fear anymore. We worship a mighty God. So, a lot of times we might learn from something. From even reading our Bibles to praying to coming to church, we might learn something if we give it a shot. You can trust in Jesus. Sometimes we might not feel like we are worthy of this, this gift that we made too many mistakes. You are too much of a bad person. 
I can't trust anyone. My heart's been broken too many times. You can trust in Jesus. He won't fail you. He won't fail you. He'll teach you more about yourself than anything else. He'll show you things that you never believed were possible. So today, I remind you of Jesus' story, okay? Of his sacrifice, his deliverance, him as mediator, and as king. He is our life to live by. He is alive today. That's a that's beauty. He is alive today. I remind you some of, uh, some of you about this. You guys, a lot of you might have already known the story or how, this, how Jesus was reflected in the Old Testament. Some of you might never heard this before, and this is an opportunity for you. This is an opportunity for all of us. But that is not my prayer, that you just heard this again. My prayer is that when you go from here, you go with a new perspective. That you leave here with a new perspective. To live gloriously. To live out love. To forgive. As we heard from Anthony this morning, to live different than the world around us. And to follow Jesus, to walk with Jesus. I'm not just saying that as a phrase, okay? To walk with Jesus. Jesus is here now with us. He's not some distant memory. Don't make him that. He deserves much more than that. He deserves so much from me. This world needs to hear about him. This world can be changed because of him. His kingdom can be now. <sighs> now, if you don't know him, seek him. One of those ways is on the back of your bulletin. You might have picked one up. There's a number. <laughs> it's the church number. Give us a call. Talk to one of us pastors, myself included. Or maybe a friend brought you here today. Talk with them more about this. So, now we're, we're going to pray in a few moments. But for you who call yourself Christ followers, anyone that calls them Christ follower, I want you to uh, kind of do something with me while, while we pray. I want you to hold out your hands like you're cupping water. You might have come here overwhelmed, burdened. Maybe you regret something. Maybe there was a tragedy, a death. Maybe there's sickness. If you believe in our Creator, if you believe that Jesus saved us from our sins, that deliver us from that sin, that is our meteor before God, that is our king all-powerful. He can take care of you. He can take care of you. If he, God Almighty is willing to send his son to die for us, and some of us think we're not that important, you're also, you're so important. He sent his son to die for you. This this bondage, this, this regret, this op missed opportunity, maybe it's a blessing that's on your heart. Maybe it's something that you need to share with somebody else. We're going to pray, and we're going to give that to God today. We're also going to pray, uh, pray a prayer. If this is your, your first time hearing about Jesus, and you want to give your, your life to him, follow him, I want you to pray this prayer with me. So let's all bow our head. Jesus, there is so much that you have done. You have lived a flawless life and died for my sins. I do not deserve this, but you gave me the, this gift anyways. I believe you died and rose again. I believe in you. I believe you saved me from my sin. I choose to follow you and I'll seek you daily. 
Amen. I encourage you right now to tell somebody today. It's not easy. It's not easy. But in my experience, if God has spoken to your heart and you don't do something immediately, you will regret it. You will walk away from it. And you'll miss out on something beautiful, something marvelous, something that you won't regret in the future. Something Jesus brings hope to our lives. There's points in my life where it feels like everything else is falling down. Life is crumbling. But Jesus is there. Sometimes he might be the only thing that you can hold on to. But once, and you will, once you get through that, and you will, you will have such a story to share. You will find a new part of your own character and identity in Christ. You are a part of this story as well this epic story. It's not just this book. You are a part of it as well. Thank you, guys. May you go from here knowing how glorious Jesus is and how powerful is our King you are sent.